Dear Father in heaven, Father, I thank you and praise you that we can be in your house of worship today. And Lord, I just ask that you would surround us with your Holy Spirit. I ask that you would surround us with your angels and would drive away Satan and all the distractions and trials he tries to bring to our mind as we worship you. Father, may your spirit rest upon us that we may know what you have to say to us specifically today. And Father, perform the miracle of hearing for us that we hear the words that you're speaking to us. Put your words upon my lips. If there is something more to be said, Father, as always, show me what that is. And Father, may we have a sweet time of worship with you today so that we can go forth from this house of worship being the people that you want us to be that we can be the witnesses that you want us to be. And Lord, I just lift it all to you in the name of Christ and by your will. Amen. <clears throat> Turn with me to our text today. Turn with me to Genesis chapter 49, 8 to 12. Can everyone hear okay? If you can't, speak up please. We'll adjust things here. Genesis chapter 49. In verses 8 through 12. All right, Genesis 49 and verse 8. Judah, your brothers will praise you. You will grasp your enemies by the neck. All your relatives will bow before you. Judah, my son, is along as a young lion that has finished eating its prey. Like a lion, he crouches and lies down. Like a lioness, who dares to rouse him? The scepter will not depart from Judah, nor the ruler's staff from his descendants, until the coming of the one to whom it belongs, the one to whom all nations will honor. He ties his foal to a grapevine, the colt of his donkey to a choice vine. He washes his clothes in wine, his robes in the blood of grapes. His eyes are darker than wine, and his teeth are whiter than milk. Friends, today we're continuing the sermon series entitled Dysfunctional Families of the Bible. You know, so oftentimes we look at the heroes of the Bible stories as these type of superheroes that were not, were not real. We feel that we could never achieve the, the holiness that these people have. We look at them and think that they, they led these wonderful lives, that they didn't have the trials and tribulations that we have today. But you know, folks, that couldn't be further from the truth, further from the truth. The Lord has left these stories here for us so that we can understand how God helped these people, the mistakes they made, what happened, and how God led despite that. God is willing to take imperfect men and women and to use them for his work. And you know, friends, I find that a great comfort and a great, a great inspiration in my struggles with sin in this world. Praise God. Praise God that he has left us these accounts. Well, today we're going to be studying about a very imperfect man of God. In fact, he was a very unlikely Bible hero. <laughs> But despite all of his mistakes, despite all of his struggles, his name became one of the titles for Christ. Turn with me to the book of Revelation chapter 5 and beginning in verse 2. Revelation chapter 5 and beginning in verse 2. Revelation 5 and verse 2. And I saw a strong angel who shouted with a loud voice, Who is worthy to break the seals on this scroll and open it? But no one in heaven or on earth or under the earth was able to open the scroll and read it. Then I began to weep bitterly because no one was found worthy to open the scroll and read it. But one of the 24 elders said to me, Stop weeping. Look, the lion of the tribe of Judah, the heir to David's throne, has won the victory. He is worthy to open the scroll and its seven seals. Now, friends, did you notice here in verse 5 what it says? It says, the lion of the tribe of Judah. 
Now here the triumphant, triumphant lamb of God in verse 6 is also called the lion of the tribe of Judah. And the lamb, of course, is the risen Christ who gained the victory over sin for you and for me. It refers to Christ. So we see that Christ's earthly heritage was from this very unlikely hero, Judah. So just who was Judah and what kind of family did he come from? What was it like for him? Well, for us to understand Judah, I believe that it's important to understand Judah's parents and family. You see, Judah's father was Jacob. And if ever there was a, disfamily, a dysfunctional family, folks, it was Jacob's. Many of us will remember the story of the twin brothers, Jacob and Esau. Jacob and Esau had been born to Isaac and Rebekah. And even before their birth, the two babies seemed to be fighting with one another. Turn with me to Genesis 25 and beginning in verse 19. I'm reading from mostly the uh, New Living Translation today. Genesis chapter 25 and beginning in verse 19. Genesis 25 verse 19. This is the account of the family of Isaac, the son of Abraham. When Isaac was 40 years old, he married Rebekah, the daughter of Bethuel, the Aramean, from Paddan Aram, and the sister of Laban, the Aramean. Isaac pleaded with the Lord on behalf of his wife because she was unable to have children. The Lord answered Isaac's prayer, and Rebekah became pregnant with twins. But the two children struggled with each other in her womb, so she went to ask the Lord about it. Why is this happening to me, she asked. And the Lord told her, the sons in your womb will become two nations. From the very beginning, the two nations will be rivals. One nation will be stronger than the other, and your older son will serve your younger son. And when the time came to give birth, Rebecca discovered that she indeed, indeed did have twins. The first one was very red at birth and covered with thick hair like a fur coat, so they named him Esau. Then the other twin was born with his hand grasping Esau's heel, so they named him Jacob. Isaac was 60 years old when the twins were born. Well, friends, Jacob was the younger twin, and it wasn't long until their personalities were seen by everyone as being very different. By adulthood, Jacob had become a, a very deeply spiritual man. He loved learning about God. He enjoyed being at home and helping his family. Rebecca especially loved Jacob, and the more he was, and the, and the young man that he was becoming. But Jacob's twin, Esau, was quite different. You see, he loved adventure very early on in his life. Esau became a very accomplished hunter, and he loved every moment of the chase. After one of his adventures, he would come home and make a tasty meat stew, for, especially for his father, Isaac. Then he and Isaac would sit there for hours, eating together, hearing about the adventures that the son had had, all that Esau had done. These exciting stories were things that the father very much liked. And by today's standard, I think that we would, we would call Esau this kind of real he-man kind of image that he had. Well, folks, in the home, it was obvious to everyone that Rebecca's favorite son was Jacob and that Isaac's favorite son was Esau. And I'm sure that their parents having favorites definitely affected the twins' relationship with one another. No question. We get a small glimpse about this when one day Esau came home extremely tired and hungry. And he found Jacob cooking this lentil stew. So Esau asked his brother to share some of that stew with him. He had just come back from the hunt and he was so hungry. He was so famished. He wanted some of that stew very badly. Well, Jacob saw an opportunity here. Jacob saw an opportunity to get what his heart craved more than anything, the family birthright. 
You see, folks, the birthright was about far more than just inheriting extra money in those days. Yes, they, they did inherit extra money. But you see, the son who inherited the birthright also was the spiritual leader of the family, the spiritual head of the family. And it was this closeness to God that he craved. And besides, Jacob was aware of the angel's prophecy to his mother, Rebekah, that Jacob would, would have the birthright. Well, Jacob saw an opportunity here. He saw an opportune moment. And he told his brother that, sure, he could have some of the stew if he'd be willing to sell his birthright to him. Well, it didn't take but more than a moment for Esau to say that would be just fine. He didn't care that much about the birthright. All he was wanting was this wonderful stew. What good was the birthright when he was this hungry, this tired? So Esau rapidly agreed to the bargain and got this bowl of wonderful stew. Once again, this showed Esau's character, his lack of respect for the family birthright, especially the spiritual part of that family birthright. Well, folks, let's fast forward. Time has passed. Isaac's health is failing, and he knows that it's time to bestow the birthright and its blessings. So he makes plans for Esau to hunt and to come back and to make Isaac's favorite stew. Isaac's eyesight by this time is very poor. His hearing is seriously impaired. His health and his strength is failing day by day. And he knows his time is growing short. Well, Rebecca overhears the plans. And like so many of us, she swings into rapid action mode. You know, friends, I can understand her. You know, I often joke about the fact, you know, I, I worked in critical care medicine for a number of years as an RN. And you know, when you're in cardiology, and someone's going into cardiac arrest, you normally don't say, oh, excuse me, would you, would you bring the crash cart over here? And if, if you have time, bring the oxygen. And you know, you don't do that. You know, you jump up on the bed, you start doing chest compressions and shouting orders. And I think Rebecca was that type of person. Her husband's about to give the birthright to a reckless son who could care less about spiritual things. She knows the prophecy of the angel. The angel had prophesied that this, that this, this moment that the twins that were in her womb, that were fighting, that this would continue, but that the younger one would get the birthright. Like so many of us folks, like so many of us, she believes that she has to swing into action rather than trusting in God to work this mess out. She doesn't see any reasonable way to work this mess out. And maybe she's there for, for this very moment. Maybe God wants her to do this at this very moment. She sees she doesn't take time to ask, friends. So Rebecca convinces Jacob to impersonate his brother Esau and to manipulate Isaac into giving Jacob the birthright. Well, this happens. But it isn't long before Esau returns from the hunt. And when he finds out what has happened to say that he is not happy is a gross understatement of the situation. In fact, he is so angry that he plots to kill his brother Jacob as soon as Isaac is dead. So once again, Rebecca goes into her action mode and she sends Jacob to her brother Laban. She thinks that Esau will cool down, he'll cool off, and he'll be reasonable. Just give it some time. Little does she know that that will be the last time that she will ever see Jacob again in this life. Folks, what a lesson we have here about trusting in God rather than trying to fix our family messes on our own. How many of us are like Rebecca? We, we try to fix the messes on our own and just only make them worse. Yeah. Friends, Jacob travels to visit Uncle Laban and Paddan Aram. And within about a month, Jacob has already fallen in love with Laban's younger daughter, Rachel. So when Laban asked Jacob 
what he wants for uh, the wages that he wants for working for Laban. Jacob quickly suggests that his wages go toward a dowry for marrying Rachel. And folks, one of the nicer things that we can say about Laban is that he was a sleazy wheeler dealer. So he, he tells Jacob that after seven years of hard work, he can marry Rachel. That's just fine with him. And so that's what happens. Turn with me to the book of Genesis chapter 29 and verse 20. You know, I really like the way that it's put here in scripture. It's a beautiful, beautiful statement. Genesis chapter 29 and verse 20. So Jacob worked seven years to pay for Rachel, but his love for her was so strong that it seemed to him but a few days. Wow, what a beautiful love story. What a beautiful love story. His love for her was so strong that it seemed to him but a few days, wow. You know friends, sadly what was to come would set in place many, many, many family dysfunctions for years to come. You see, friends, on the wedding night, when it was time to consummate the marriage, good old Uncle Laban switches brides. Rachel's, old, Rachel's older sister, Leah, is given to Jacob. And only in the morning when he wakes up and finds that he's married to Leah, does he find out what has happened. To say that he was angry was also a terrible understatement. And what was dear old Uncle Laban's reaction? Well, let's look at Genesis 29 again, beginning in verse 26. Genesis 29 and verse 26. It's not our custom here to marry off a younger daughter ahead of the firstborn, Laban replied. But wait until the bridal week is over, and then we'll give you Rachel too, provided you promise to work another seven years for me. Wow. How sad. Folks, can you believe that one? How would you or I have felt if that would have happened to us? What would we have said and done? You find that you're married to someone you don't love, along with the true love of your life. And the two sisters are very, very different. Again, let's look at Genesis chapter 29, verses 16 and 17. Now Laban had two daughters. The older daughter was named Leah, and the younger one was Rachel. There was no sparkle in Leah's eyes, but Rachel had a beautiful figure and a lovely face. Now folks, the description here in verse 17 is a rather difficult, difficult one because the wording here can be interpreted in several ways. You know, in English, one word can often have some very different meanings. And that was true with the word that was used here. Because the word used to describe Leah's eyes can mean that they were soft, that they were delicate, frail, gentle, timid, weak, or inexperienced. Now that covers a lot of territory here, a lot of territory. But the Hebrew wording in Rachel's description says very plainly, very clearly, that she was both beautiful in form and in appearance. Or in modern language, she was great looking with an equally great body. And the impression here is that that was not the case with Leah, that she was rather average looking in her appearance, quite unlike her sister. Well, it seems that Jacob's never able to forgive Leah for whatever part she played in Laban's deception. Look again at Genesis chapter 29, beginning in verse 31. Genesis 29, verse 31. When the Lord saw that Leah was unloved, he enabled her to have children. But Rachel could not conceive. So Leah became pregnant and gave birth to a son. She named him Reuben, for she said, The Lord has noticed my misery, and now my husband will love me. She soon became pregnant again and gave birth to another son. She named him Simeon, for she said, The Lord heard that I was unloved and has given me another son. 
Then she became pregnant a third time and gave birth to another son. She named him Levi, for she said, Surely this time my husband will feel affection for me, since I've given birth to three sons. Once again, Leah became pregnant and gave birth to another son. She named him Judah, for she said, Now I will praise the Lord. And then she stopped having children. Now, folks, the NLV, NLT version here translates verse 31 that Leah was unloved. But if you look at the original Hebrew word, the original Hebrew word means hated. You see, friends, Jacob actually hated Leah. There's no way to get around this. We're also told that God took pity on Leah. He allows her to conceive four times. First she gives birth to Reuben, then to Simeon, then to Levi, and finally to Judah. And each time after the first three sons, she says, Now my husband will love me. Now. After all, Rachel's not getting pregnant. I am. I am. Folks, notice, though, that there is an interesting change in her attitude when Judah is born. She doesn't say, now my husband will love me. But she names her son Judah, which in Hebrew is believed to be related to the word for praise. And notice that she gives praise to the Lord. She praises the Lord. It's a different attitude here about Judah. Keep that in mind as we go along here. Well, this son, who would be an ancestor to the incarnated Christ, was born with praise to the Lord. Friends, if only things had continued in this vein, how different this household would have been, how different it would have been. You know, today we look at in vitro fertilization as a great medical advancement, and indeed it is. But in these times, the families had a similar system, but with different methods. You see, if a wife was not able to conceive, it was the custom then that she would give the, her personal maid to her husband, and that child would be considered her own and raised as her own. And she would give this woman to her husband as either an either, an, another wife or as a concubine, depending on the situation. So when Rachel doesn't conceive, like the customs of the time, she gives her maid Bilhah to Jacob as a third wife. Bilhah soon conceives. She gives birth to Dan and then to Naphtali. And it's interesting that the, the name Dan means he judged. He judged. Or possibly, too, it can mean he vindicated. He vindicated. And then Naphtali means my struggle. I struggle. Look at Genesis chapter 30 and verse 8 here. Very important verse, Genesis chapter 30 and verse 8. It says, Rachel named him Naphtali, for she said, I have struggled hard with my sister, and I'm winning. Mm -hmm. Folks, <laughs> the birth of sons becomes this ridiculous competition between the sisters. And it only gets worse. It only gets worse. Leah stops conceiving, so she gives Jacob her maid, Zilpah. And Zilpah conceives two more sons. Then Leah conceives two sons and a daughter whom she named Dinah. Lastly, Rachel finally conceives her first son, Joseph. But when, when she becomes pregnant once more, considerably later, Tragedy strikes with her second son. Unfortunately, Rachel dies as she gives birth to Benjamin. Well, friends, Jacob repeats the sins of his parents. Remember how his parents played favorites? Well, he's doing, he, he starts doing the same thing. Because not only does Jacob consider Rachel as his first legitimate wife, despite the situation with Leah, he also makes it abundantly clear that Joseph is his number one heir. Joseph is the first son of Rachel, remember. 
he makes it very clear to everyone that Joseph is his number one heir, despite all of the many sons born to Leah and the two maids. You remember the story of Joseph and his coat of many colors that we all learned in Sabbath school or Sunday school as children? Well, folks, those coats were elaborately embroidered coats, and they were only given to uh, men who were princes or to sons of distinction in families. It was a sign that this person was very highly valued. This was a very expensive coat that was done. That embroidery would all be by hand, remember, in those days. It took a long time to make these coats. And that's the kind of coat that Joseph was given. You see, the message from Dad Jacob was loud and clear to all, and especially to his sons. Joseph is my rightful heir. Joseph is dad's favorite, and the rest of you just aren't. So folks, let's think for a moment about the home in which Judah was growing up. Judah's father made no secret of the fact that he hated Judah's mom, Leah. Judah, Judah also knew that his status as a fourth son of his mother held very little weight with his father. And day in and day out, he was constantly hearing the bickering and the feuding of four women who were in this ridiculous contest to see how many babies they could pop out. You know, is it any wonder that Judah had problems, friends? Is it any wonder? I'm certain that it was only the grace of God, only by the grace of God, that Judah and his brothers weren't even more dysfunctional than they were. Folks, the first mention of Judah as an adult tells us that he became part of a plot involving his brothers and his sister Dinah. You see, after all of these years, Jacob and Esau had finally made peace with one another, praise God. Despite the fact that Esau was not following God as he should have been doing, they made peace. Jacob humbled himself before Esau. He humbled himself and, and finally believed that he must trust in God with this relationship. And the twins were able to depart from one another in peace. Folks, Jacob buys land from a ruler named Hamor, and he settles his family outside of the town of Shechem, which is named for Hamor's son, Shechem. Now, while the family is living there, Leah's daughter, Dinah, who is Judah's full sister, decides to go and visit the other young women who live in Shechem. Now, friends, this is a very, very dangerous move on her part. Mm -hmm. This was really a bad move. You see, she was going alone into a town that was full of idol worshipers. There was no one there that worshipped the true God. But friends, think about Dinah's situation. <clears throat> She's the only daughter of Jacob, and her mother is Leah. The only other females in her family are these four women who are constantly arguing and bickering and competing for dad's attention. She has no role models in her family who can help her in the way that a family should. And despite Jacob and possibly Leah trying to set her some spiritual examples, the message is likely lost because of the ill will and all these dysfunctions going on in her home every day. Friends, what a lesson is left here for you and for me about our homes. You know, I suspect that Dinah was likely bored. She was bored and lonely. So when she sees the ladies of Shechem, she likely thinks that this will be a great adventure away from all these spiritual constraints in her home and all the feuding in her home. It looks like these other young women are having so much fun, and she's certainly not. So she goes alone into town. Well, friends, the, the ruler's son, Shechem, sees her. And most likely, she looked like someone new and adventurous to him as well. So he grabs her and rapes her. And the really, truly bizarre thing is then he decides he's fallen in love with her and wants to ask for her in marriage from, from Dinah's dad. 
So he asked his father, Hamor, to go and get her as a wife for him. Well, Jacob and his sons find out. And Hamor and Shechem invite Jacob to settle and to trade among them, become one with their family, become one with their town. Things will be great. Everything will be brushed over. This will all turn out just fine. But you know, Genesis 34 shows us that they were being deceitful. Turn to Genesis chapter 34 and verse 23. Genesis chapter 34. Look at what it says in verse 23. Well, actually, let's go back to verse 21. These men are our friends, they said. Let's invite them to live here among us and to trade freely. Look, the land is large enough to hold them. We can take their daughters as wives and let them marry ours. But they will consider staying here and becoming one people with us, only if all of our men are circumcised, just as they are. But if we do this, all their livestock and possessions will eventually be ours. Come, let's agree to their terms and let them settle here among us. You know, we see here, notice here in verse 23, it says, eventually their possessions and livestock is going to be ours. There's a really selfish motive here. Now, we also see in those verses that the sons of Jacob have told them that they will allow Dinah to marry if all of the men in town are circumcised, that that's their custom. They're told that if they do that, then everything will work out just fine. Well, the Shechemites believe that if they convince Jacob to settle there permanently and to intermarry, that eventually the great wealth would become theirs. So we see Jacob's sons begin to hatch a plot. Simeon and Levi tell Hamar that they'll agree, but only if all the Shechemite men are circumcised, as we read. The men of Shechem agree. They see, they see the profit motive here. So, hey, what's that? You know, a little surgery here. We're, we're going to make a lot of money. But three days later, when the men are recovering from their surgeries, Levi and Simeon take revenge. Turn to chapter 34, and let's look at, at verse uh, 24, Genesis 34, beginning in verse 24. So all the men in the town council agreed with Hamar and Shechem, and every male in the town was circumcised. But three days later, when their wounds were still sore, two of Jacob's sons, Simeon and Levi, who were Dinah's full brothers, took their swords and entered the town with opposition. Then they slaughtered every male there, including Hamar and his son, Shechem. They killed them with their swords, then took Dinah from Shechem's house and returned to their camp. Oh, friends, what a mess. What a mess. Scripture tells us that Simeon and Levi are the leaders and the primary actors in this plot. They conceal their plan from Dad because they don't believe that he will act firmly enough about the situation with Ina. Plus, Scripture indicates later that these two sons are hotheads anyway. They're quick to start a fight. Scripture tells us that. But notice what it said there in verse 27. I think that it's likely that at this point Judah joined in on what had happened and all this looting and what they did to the town. I'm sure that he was there. Verse 31 shows that he may have agreed even with Levi and Simeon's actions. The brothers likely saw Jacob as a, as a wimp when it came to doing something concrete about their sister's rape. So while Judah did not initiate the action, it looks like he went along with it. Well, friends, the next mention that we have of Judah occurs in more sordid business. It occurs in the business of their brother Joseph. That is number one. I remember, as I said, that Jacob had played favorites with Joseph. So when Joseph tells his brothers and his father about dreams which God sent to him, the brothers become very angry. We won't take time to look at those dreams today, but as you recall, both of them uh, gave the interpretation that at some point that the brothers would bow down to Joseph. Folks, the messages of those dreams were very clear. The family would be bowing in some way to Joseph's authority at some point in the future. 
So the brothers become enraged and jealous. They've had enough. And even Jacob scolds Joseph a bit here, despite realizing that the dreams may have a significant meaning. Well, Genesis chapter 37 and verse 2 tells us that at this point that Joseph is 17 years old. He's 17 years old. And we know that at this point that he's working for his half-brothers. Look at chapter 37 of Genesis in verse 2. Turn over to 37, chapter 37. Let's look at verse 2 here. This is the account of Jacob and his family. When Joseph was 17 years old, he often tended his father's flocks. He worked for his half-brothers, the sons of his father's wives, Bilhah and Zilpah. But Joseph reported to his father some of the bad things his brothers were doing. Jacob loved Joseph more than any of his other children because Joseph had been born to him in his old age. So one day Jacob had a special gift made for Joseph, a beautiful robe. But his brothers hated Joseph because their father loved him more than the rest of them. They couldn't say a kind word to him. Now these sons would have been Dan, Naphtali, Gad, and Asher. And remember that their mothers had a, had a family status even lower than Leah's. Because they were the maids, remember. And apparently their actions were not consistent with God's ways. Idolatry had even to some degree crept into this family. We see that later. We're told in Genesis chapter 35 that Jacob purifies his home of all of the household idols that had been brought in. So scripture spares us of the details of these four brothers' actions, but Joseph, even at 17 years old, is truly, truly concerned about whatever it is that his brothers are doing. He tells his father, but friends, he tells his father in the hopes that Jacob will act in helping them to spiritually change. Remember that, that Joseph is deeply spiritual as well. He's not being a tattletale. He wants to see change. He's worried about his brothers. But you see, his brothers definitely do not, do not take it in that sense. First of all, they're not interested in making any changes. Then they see Joseph as nothing but this pampered tattletale. So when Jacob sends Joseph to check on his hot-headed sons, the sons see Jacob only as an unneeded threat. Or, I'm sorry, as Joseph as an unneeded threat. Joseph is only a threat to them. Look at Genesis chapter 37, beginning in verse 18. When Joseph's brothers saw him coming, they recognized him in the distance. As he approached, they made plans to kill him. Here comes a dreamer, they said. Come on, let's kill him and throw him into one of these cisterns. We can tell our father, a wild animal has eaten him. Then we'll see what becomes of his dreams. But when Reuben heard of their schemes, he came to Joseph's rescue. Let's not kill him, he said. Why should we shed any blood? Let's just throw him into this empty cistern here in the wilderness. Then he'll die without our laying a hand on him. Reuben was secretly planning to rescue Joseph and return him to his father. So when Joseph arrived, his brothers ripped off the beautiful robe he was wearing. Then they grabbed him and threw him into the cistern. Now the cistern was empty. There was no water in it. Then just as they were sitting down to eat, they looked up and saw a caravan of camels in the distance coming toward them. It was a group of Ishmaelite traders taking a load of gum, balm, and aromatic resin from Gilead down to Egypt. So Judah said to his brothers, what will we gain by killing our brother? We'd have to cover up the crime. Instead of hurting him, let's, let's sell him to those Ishmaelite traders. After all, he is our brother, our own flesh and blood. So his brothers agreed. So when the Ishmaelites who were Midianite traders came by Joseph, came by, Joseph's brothers pulled him out of the cistern and sold him to them for 20 pieces of silver. And the traders took him to Egypt. Sometime later, Reuben returned to get Joseph out of the cistern. When he discovered that Joseph was missing, he tore his clothes in grief. Then he went back to his brothers and lamented, The boy is gone. What will I do now? And the brothers killed a young goat and dipped Joseph's blood, robe in its blood. They sent the beautiful robe to their father with this message. Look at what we found. 
Doesn't this robe belong to your son? Wow. You know, folks, it's very interesting here who tried to save Joseph. By this time, Reuben is showing that he is changing. He's unwilling to face down his hot-headed brothers here. But he plans to secretly save Joseph. Now, folks, this says a lot about Reuben because remember that Reuben was Jacob's firstborn son. His mother was Leah. And he could have rightly felt cheated by Jacob's favoritism to Rachel and to Joseph. But it seems that Jacob, Jacob's spirituality was finally rubbing off, finally having some effect here on Reuben. He's devastated by his brother's actions. But unfortunately, he is still not willing to tell Jacob the truth. So he goes along with the story. And notice that Judah wants to save Joseph as well. He acts like he's going along with his brothers, and when they are eating, they've cooled down a little bit, Judah sees a way to prevent Joseph's death. Now remember that the Ishmaelites were their great-grandfather's son. Remember who, remember who Ishmael was. So these Ishmaelite traitors were distant relatives. So perhaps he justified his actions in that way as well. After all, I'm sending him away with relatives. It's not like they're total strangers. Perhaps he justified that. I don't know. We're not told. But whatever happened, at any rate, Judah is instrumental in saving Joseph. But like Reuben, he goes along with his brother's story. He won't tell dad the truth about what really happened to Joseph. And I don't think that any of them were prepared for Jacob's reaction. Because in verse 35 here, we're told that Jacob vows to mourn until he himself dies. These brothers see their father going through a grief that they had never anticipated, folks. Perhaps the greatest window we see into Judah's adult character is the story in Genesis 38. You see, after the Joseph incident, Judah leaves home. And I suspect that he has had his fill of the family dysfunctions at this point. And what happens next covers his life for about a 20 year or more period. You see, Judah likely has decided that home is never gonna change. It's never gonna change. So he moves to Agilim and stays with a man there named Hira. Contrary to God's command, Judah marries a Canaanite woman who's the daughter of a man named Shua. Together they have three sons. They name them Ur, Onan, and Shelah. Folks, there are very good reasons why God tells us not to intermarry with unbelievers. There's good reasons, folks, why we need to be careful even where we live and the influences that our children have. Pagan influences take their toll on Judah's family, that's for sure. Because first, when Ur comes of age, Judah's son, first son, Judah arranges for Ur to marry this, this woman named Tamar. She comes from a pagan family likewise. Turn over to Genesis chapter 38 and look at verse 6, beginning in 6. Genesis 38 and verse 6. In the course of time, Judah arranged for his firstborn son, Ur, to marry a young woman named Tamar. But Ur was a wicked man in the Lord's sight, so the Lord took his life. Then Judah said to Ur's brother Onan, Go and marry Tamar, as our brother requires of the brother of a man who has died. You must produce an heir for your brother. But Onan was not willing to have a child who would not be his own heir. Jump down to verse 10. But the Lord considered it evil for Onan to deny a child for his dead, to his dead brother. So the Lord took Onan's life too. Then Judah said to Tamar, his daughter-in-law, Go back to your parents' home and remain a widow until my son Sheila is old enough to marry you. But Judah didn't really intend to do this because he was afraid Sheila would also die like his two brothers. So Tamar went back to her father's home. Wow. What a messed up family. What a family. You see, friends, everything, all the influences take their toll. They take their toll. 
Well, friends, let's fast forward some years, and Judah still hasn't called for Tamar. Judah's wife dies during this time, and Judah is greatly grieved for his wife. So Judah and his friend Hiram plan to go to Timnah to shear the sheep in order to supervise this. These are Judah's sheep. Well, Tamar finds out, and she decides it's time to take action. She changes into the clothing of a shrine prostitute, which involves wearing a veil over her face to conceal her face. Now remember also that Judah hasn't seen her for a number of years. Well, when he sees her, he propositions her. And she agrees. She's sitting along the roadside like a shrine prostitute. She asks, how he, she asks how much that he will pay, and Judah says that he'll send her a young goat. But since he doesn't have the goat with him, he gives Tamar his identification seal that he does business with. It would be like handing your checkbook to someone. He gives his identification seal and its cord, as well as his walking stick. She agrees, and the deal is sealed. So Judah goes on to the sheep shearing and later sends Hira back with this goat. Well, Hira searches high and low, and there is no shrine prostitute to be found. He asks in the village. The villagers tell him that no such woman exists in that area. They don't have any shrine prostitutes there. So Judah decides to give up because he's starting to look rather foolish, and he's afraid he's going to become the laughing stock of the entire town. Let's fast forward a few months. Everyone begins to notice that Tamar is pregnant. And Judah becomes indignant. Look at chapter 38 and beginning in verse 24, chapter 38 and verse 24 of Genesis. About three months later, Judah was told, Tamar, your daughter-in-law, has acted like a prostitute, and now because of this, she's pregnant. Bring her out and let her be burned, Judah demanded. But as they were taking her out to kill her, she sent this message to her father-in-law. The man who owns these things made me pregnant. Look closely. Whose seal and cord and walking stick are these? Wow. Wow. Well, friends, Tamar gives birth to twin sons, Perez and Zerah. And we'll hear more about them in just a minute here. But folks, during all of these years, Judah's brother Joseph has gone from being a slave in Egypt to being a prisoner and finally to being second in charge of the land of Egypt. God uses Joseph in a mighty way to save Egypt from a seven-year drought. Seven-year drought. He uses, he uses Joseph to save so many. And Jacob's sons have aged. And it seems that finally, finally, some of Jacob's spirituality has rubbed off on his sons. The seven-year famine begins and food becomes very scarce, even for Jacob and his family. So by this time, all of Jacob's sons are, are living with Jacob again. Most likely, the famine may have helped to bring them back together so they could help one another. Providentially, Jacob hears that there is grain in the land of Egypt, and he sends his ten sons there, minus Benjamin. You see, Benjamin is all that he has left of his beloved Rachel. He doesn't trust their other sons to keep Benjamin safe for rather obvious reasons. So the ten sons go to Egypt, and Joseph recognizes them immediately. It's been many years since these brothers sold their 17-year-old brother into slavery. And this ruler of Egypt bears no resemblance to the Joseph of 17 years old. Joseph's stunned to see them, of course. And he wonders if they've changed. He wonders if they've changed from the hotheads that they were. So Joseph tests them. It won't take time to read the whole story today, but Joseph accuses them first of spying and puts him in prison and tells him to choose one of them to stay behind while the other br brothers go back and bring Benjamin to prove that they're not spies. Remember that Simeon and Levi were the ringleaders in Shechem. So I wonder if Simeon was the ringleader in the plot to kill Joseph as well. Well, at any rate, Joseph sends them home, keeping Simeon in jail. That's why I think it might have been Simeon who had been the ringleader 
and, and trying to kill him. But he arranges to, to put the, their, their money back into the sacks of those that he sends back to Egypt. Well, the nine sons go home. They report all to Jacob. And Jacob's not willing for Benjamin to go. He won't do it. Despite all of Reuben's pleadings, he, he doesn't want to lose that one son of, of, that he has from Rachel. But finally, when the grain runs out, Jacob feels forced into allowing Benjamin to go back with his other sons to Egypt. And Judah's farewell speech says a lot about his change of character. Look at chapter 43 and verses 8 through 10. Turn over to Genesis 43 and look at verses 8 through 10. Judah said to his father, send the boy with me and we will be on our way. Otherwise, we'll all die of starvation. And not only we, but you and our little ones. I personally guarantee his safety. You may hold me responsible if I don't bring him back to you. Then let me bear the blame forever. If we hadn't wasted all this time, we could have gone and returned twice by now. You see, folks, the, the brothers return, and Benjamin goes with them. Benjamin goes with them, finally. The brothers are, are mystified when Joseph uh, orders them to this wonderful banquet. As soon as they get there, he has this lavish banquet put out, and Joseph seats them according to age, and that mystifies them as well. How could this man of Egypt know their ages? And Joseph also gives Benjamin five times more food than the others. But once again, Joseph tests them. This time he orders the brothers' monies back into their grain sacks as before, but he also has the personal silver drinking cup that he uses placed in Benjamin's bag. And as soon as the brothers leave, he sends his palace manager to catch up with them. The manager accuses them of stealing Joseph's cup, and the brothers strongly deny that and tell the manager that if, they, if the cup is found in any of their sacks, that that man will die. They are honest men. They didn't take anything. But when the manager looks and finds the cup in Benjamin's bag, we once more see the brothers change of character finally. Turn to Genesis 44 and beginning in verse 13. Genesis chapter 44, beginning in verse 13. When the brothers saw him, they tore their clothing in despair. Then they loaded their donkeys again and returned to the city. Joseph was still in his palace when Judah and his brothers arrived, and they fell to the ground before him. What have you done, Joseph demanded, though you know what a man like me can predict the future? Judah answered, Oh, my Lord, what can we say to you? How can we explain this? How can we prove our innocence? God is punishing us for our sins. My Lord, we've returned. We've all returned to be your slaves, all of us, just not our brother who had your cup in his sack. No, Joseph said, I would never do such a thing. Only the man who stole the cup will be my slave. The rest of you can go back to your father in peace. Then Judah stepped forward and said, Please, my Lord, let your servant say one word to you. Please don't be angry with me, even though you are as powerful as Pharaoh himself. My Lord, previously you'd ask, your ser you'd ask us, your servants, Do you have a father or brother? And we responded, Yes, my Lord. We have a father who is an old man, and his youngest son is a child of his old age. His full brother is dead, and he alone is left of his mother's children, and his father loves him very much. And you said to us, Bring him here so I can see him with my own eyes. But we said to you, My Lord, the boy cannot leave his father, for his father would die. But you told us, Unless the younger brother comes with you, we'll never see my face again. So we returned to your servant, our father, and told him what you had said. Later, when he said, go back again and buy us more food, we replied, we can't go unless you let our youngest brother go with us. We'll never get to see the man's face unless our youngest brother is with us. Then my father said to us, as you know, my wife had two sons, and one of them went away and never returned. Doubtless he was torn to pieces by some wild animal. I've never seen him since. Now, if you take his brother away from me and any harm comes to him, you will send this breathing, white-haired man to his grave. And now, my Lord, I can't go back to my father without the boy. Our father's life is bound up with this boy's life. If he sees that the boy is not with us, our father will die. We, your servants, will indeed be responsible for sending that grieving, white-haired man to his grave. 
my Lord, I guaranteed to my father that I would take care of the boy. I told him, if I don't bring him back to you, I will bear the blame forever. So please, my Lord, let me stay here as a slave instead of the boy and let the boy return with his brothers. For how can I return to my father if the boy is not with me? I couldn't bear to see the anguish this would cause my father. Oh, folks, we see what a difference here in Judah's impassioned plea for Benjamin. It's Judah who has offered his life for his brothers. It no longer matters to him that Benjamin has been the pampered and favored son after Joseph was gone. It doesn't matter anymore. His own story was Tamar and his marriage and his own sons have taken their toll on Judah as well. It's taken their toll. And now he's willing to give his own life for someone else, for this, ben, this son of, of Rachel, Benjamin. He was willing to give his own life for another man, much as his descendant Christ would one day sacrifice his life for all of us folks. Friends, Joseph, Joseph himself, Joseph uh, reveals himself rather to his brothers and Jacob and his family come and settle in the land of Egypt. And the last time we see Judah is when his father gives the blessings to his sons. The very last time we see him is in Genesis 49 and verse 8. Turn to Genesis 49 and verse 8 here. We see the close of the story. 49 and verse 8. Judah, your brothers will praise you. You will grasp your enemies by the neck. All your relatives will bow before you. Judah, my son, is a young lion that has finished eating its prey. Like a lion, he crouches and lies down. Like a lioness who dares to rouse him. The scepter will not depart from Judah, nor the ruler's staff from his descendants, until the coming of the one to whom it belongs, the one whom all nations will honor. He ties his foal to a grapevine, the colt of a donkey to a choice vine. He washes his clothes in wine, his robes in the blood of grapes. His eyes are darker than wine, and his teeth are whiter than milk. Folks, it's amazing that Judah is the one chosen to be the ancestor of the incarnated Christ of all of these sons. Of all of the sons, would we have chosen Judah, friends? Would we have chosen Judah? I think we might have been more prone to choose Joseph or maybe Benjamin or, or maybe even one of the other sons, but not Judah. You know, his blessing here was a messianic prophecy. And let's not forget the role that Tamar played here. We won't take time to look at it, but remember in Matthew chapter 1, the lineage of Christ only mentions four women. Only four women. Three of them, including Tamar, were not Israelites. The fourth one was an adulteress, Bathsheba. Now, if you or I would have picked people for this lineage, would we have chosen these four ladies? Much less the men. Would we have chosen Judah? And what about Judah's son, Perez, by Tamar? Friends, what kind of message was God sending here to you and to me today? You know, folks, God is calling each one of us right now, today, to do great things for him. I truly believe that. What is he calling you and me to do today? It doesn't matter what kind of dysfunctional families we've come from. It doesn't matter, folks. Look at this mess. It doesn't matter how messed up our lives have been. God can forgive anything. He can use us as a tool for his kingdom if we are willing. We're told in scripture that Satan stands before God accusing us, saying that we're not good enough or strong enough or religious enough to save. But praise God, Christ stands between us and Satan and simply says, my blood, my blood is sufficient. Friends, God is calling each and every one of us today to do great things for him. To do great things. I'm sure that Judah felt so unworthy to plead for his brother's life, especially after he had not stood up for Joseph. And he'd gone along with the cover-up. I can only imagine how humiliated he must have felt over the incidents with Tamar. 
Yet their one twin son, Perez, was an ancestor of Christ. Folks, notice that Judah's, Judah's growth was gradual. In his case, at least, the change did not come overnight. Now, sometimes God does give us an overnight change, no question. The person who we have been is gone, and by God's grace, we have a new life. That happens. But always remember that the changes are just as real if God is making them gradually in our lives as he did for Judah. The important, the important question is, are you and I growing? Are we growing, friends? Are we willing to change? Is status quo good enough for us? Or do we crave a higher goal just like father, Judah's father Jacob did? You know, remember, he, he, wanted that, he, he wanted that birthright because he wanted the spiritual connection with God. Friends, do we have that craving for God? Friends, I challenge you today to ask God to grow you for whatever purpose he has for your life. Whatever purpose he has. Use your own and your family's dysfunctions to achieve a higher good, a higher goal. Look for the positives which you have in your life, maybe as a result of some of these dysfunctions in your family or even in yourself. You know, my dad helped me to have a, a problem-solving, problem can-do attitude about life, despite all of his dysfunctions. Celebrate the good and leave the, leave the bad in God's capable hands, friends. God is calling, he's calling you and me today, anyone who is willing to be his worker. Friends, are we asking and are we listening? Are we listening? Are we willing to be used? Are we willing to be used? I promise you, friends, whatever your background, whatever the problems in your life or your families, God wants to use you today. Please pray with me. Dear Father, we lift ourselves up to you. We have nothing to bring, nothing. You know our dysfunctional lives and those of our families. But Father, this story here tells us so much about what you are willing to do for us. Please, Lord, please, I ask that you would use us. You use Judah. You use all these other people despite all the messes in their lives. Father, we humbly come before you today, and we are willing. We are not worthy, but we are willing. Please use us, Father. Help us to leave the problems in your hands, to see the good, and to leave the bad in your hands. But most of all, Father, that we will use our lives as workers for your kingdom. Lord, we lift ourselves up today in humility and in all of our problems, and we ask for your love. Your love to cover us and to spread to those around us in this dying world. Father, we know the time is short. We see the signs around us more than ever before. Please, Father, use us for your kingdom. We ask in the name of Jesus, by your will, amen. Please join in singing our closing hymn.